the New Mexico desert can be beautiful when the stately yucca, official flower of the land of enchantment, waves its great plume of snow-white bells against the turquoise sky, the brilliant red blossom of the graceful ocotilla, the delicate tints of the cactus blossom. Even the lowly cat claw adds to the scene with a riot of gorgeous yellow pompons waving in the breeze. But the first time I followed a sandy trail into the Red Lake country, I found a vast expanse of drifting sand, scattered mesquite brush, and little else. It was an area which had been so forgotten by nature that ranchers hesitated to buy it. As I surveyed this area, I wouldn't have given fifty dollars for all of it I could see, and I could see half a million acres. All this is changed now. A paved road leads us to a busy industrial plant. This is the mine and refinery of International Minerals and Chemical Corporation, built in 1940 by the Potash Division of that firm. These are the refineries, warehouses, and shops. Four shafts pierce the desert, reaching downward nearly a thousand feet to the potash beds below. Nearly one-fourth of all the potash produced in America comes from this plant, which employs almost a thousand men. These men arrive at the plant, change clothes, and prepare to go underground for their shift's work. Production rolls on around the clock every day of every year. As one shift leaves, another arrives to take its place. These men start their trip down the shaft, passing through 300 feet of caliche and limestone, then 500 feet of solid rock salt, to the 800-foot level where langbanite ore is mined. This is a double sulfate of potash and magnesia. 50 feet below this is another langbanite mine. On down to the 900-foot level where the sylvite bed is located. About two-thirds of the company's production comes from this level. Here, hewn out of the solid ore, is the office of the mine foreman. It is equipped with telephone, bulletin board, files, and maps showing the progress of mining operations. These maps show the method of mining used here. It makes a sort of checkerboard with rooms mined out and pillars left to support the overburden. In 1939, only number one shaft was completed. In 1940, tunnels were extended from the shaft toward the ore beds. In 1941, number two shaft was completed and mining of the ore was begun in earnest. With the coming of the war years, foreign supplies of potash were cut off and the demand for more and more production from American mines kept mining operations expanding at an ever increasing rate. After the war, America was called upon to supply food and fiber for most of the rest of the free world. The need for high production from our soils meant more and more potash. Operations were expanded on all fronts of the mining area until in 1951, mining had been extended into four sections. Since then, two more shafts have been sunk, extending the mine even further. And now, a group of men arrive from the surface. They leave the cage and start down the entry toward the mining area, ready to begin their shift's work. Some will run the drills, others the undercutters, loading machines, shuttle cars, and the locomotives which haul the ore. The trip to the working area is sometimes more than a mile from the shaft, and it is made in this steel man-trip car. This is a face of potash ore. What is potash? Well, it is a salt. Common salt is sodium chloride, while potash salts are potassium chloride. But how did this potash get here? 250 million years ago, much of southwestern United States was covered by the Permian Sea. But as the land masses tilted, the water drained off, leaving landlocked seas exposed to the hot, dry climate, which gradually evaporated their waters, depositing the minerals along the brackish brink. and building great salt beds. When conditions were right, potash was deposited. Sometimes mud washed onto the salt beds where it would dry and crack, later to be covered by more salt as the sea waters returned, then left again. Now, millions of years later and 850 feet below the surface, we find the imprint of these mud checks on the ceiling of the mine. 
One of the first concerns in opening a mine is to ensure a supply of good air. These three giant fans installed near number two shaft can move over 200,000 cubic feet of air a minute. Near number three shaft are two more fans, adding another 150,000 cubic feet a minute to the air moving capacity. Fresh air is drawn down the shaft, out through the mine, and brought back through other air courses to the fans, then blown to the surface through the air compartment of the shaft. With nearly 300 miles of tunnels in the mine, the air must be directed to the working area by walls or stoppings. Temporary curtains, which can be moved from place to place, are hung near the working areas, holding the air out of tunnels and rooms in which no work is being done. Formerly, much of the work in mines was done with the shovel, but in this mine, shovels have largely been replaced by machines. Before mining starts in a face, the supervisor inspects it and marks it to direct the drillers and undercutter men in their work. Here are the drillers running holes into which dynamite will be loaded. These are electrically powered auger type drills. They are mounted on jack bars which are firmly wedged between the floor and the ceiling, or the bottom and the back as they are called. Holes are drilled about nine feet into the face. Much of the drilling in this mine, however, is now done by big machines like this one. Two booms are mounted on the machine, one on each side, with an operator for each boom. They can be moved into any position and spread as much as 24 feet apart. Hydraulic power brings the boom up to the exact spot marked for the next hole and drives the bit nine feet into the face in about one minute. Next, the face is undercut to provide space for the ore to start breaking as the dynamite is exploded. The long blade on the front of this machine is equipped with bits which bite into the ore, cutting a swath like a bandsaw. Now the face is ready for the powder man. He loads his powder wagon with dynamite and drives it up to the face. Here the powder man is punching holes into the ends of regular sticks of dynamite. Into each of these holes he places an electric cap. These are the primers. When they receive an electric charge, they explode, setting off the other sticks in the hole. He takes these to the face, then brings in his dynamite. Into each hole which the drillers have left goes one of the primer sticks. Then more sticks of dynamite are loaded into the hole and firmly tamped into place. It is this tight fit which causes the exploding dynamite to break the ore rather than just shooting out of the hole like a bullet out of the barrel of a rifle. Next he ties the wires on the primer caps together. At the end of the shift, when all other men have left the working areas, the powder man connects the cable on his truck to the wire leading from the primer caps in the face. Now everything is ready, and with a final warning, fire in the hole. The switch is thrown, and 170 tons of ore was jarred from its ancient resting place. Here is the muck pile. Some of it has been thrown 30 feet from the face. This bulldozer comes into the face, pushing the scattered ore up into a close pile so that the loading machine will not have to do this job. This machine also builds roadways, loading ramps, and railway beds. Working under its own power, it finds many uses in the mine. Here we see it cleaning a face, doing in seconds what it would take the hand mucker minutes to do with a shovel, and doing it much easier. It has a diesel engine, but it has been made safe for use in the mine by passing the exhaust through a scrubber. This is a tank filled with chemicals that neutralize all harmful gases. Now the loading machine comes into the face, followed by the shuttle car. 
the operator controls it by levers. But his first job is to get his bar and go check the back for loose pieces of ore. That is the first duty of any man who enters a face. But danger of unexpected falls is slight. See how tough and springy the ore is, hanging together even when pulled on with a long bar. But it must come down to make the mine safe for all who might pass that way. Now the loading machine starts its work. Notice the lobster-like claws on the front of it. Its snout roots into the ore as it crawls forward. Its tail wags. It looks like some prehistoric monster. It loads 10 tons into the shuttle car in about a minute. You couldn't get enough men into the face to do this with shovels. The shuttle car dumps its load into the transfer elevator, which carries it up and into the mine cars waiting on the track. Then back it goes for another 10 tons of ore. With all of the cars loaded, the trolley locomotive starts for the nearest point on the main line of the underground railway system. There the load will be left on a siding, waiting for the main line locomotive to pick it up and take it to the shaft. This motor will pick up empty cars and come back for more ore. When the ore must be hauled down long grades, two motors are hitched to the trip, not to pull the load, but to provide extra braking power to hold it back. Now our sylvite ore is on its way out of the mine. On the Langmanite levels, there are no tracks. These jeeps are used for hauling men and supplies. All of the ore is moved in shuttle cars on these levels. Here is one of them, bringing ore from the face to a raise on the 850-foot level. This raise is a hole 14 by 40 feet between the 850-foot and the 900-foot levels. It will hold about 500 tons of ore and serves as storage space as well as a means of getting the ore from one level to another. Mining methods are much the same as on the lower level and the same type of machines are used. But all of the ore is hauled to raises like this one, then drawn out of the bottom of the rays, going to the shaft over the rails on the 900 foot level. Back on the 900 foot level, we see the Langmanite motor pulling in under the bottom of the rays. Doors have been installed at the bottom of the rays and chutes lead from them, extending over the tracks. At a signal from the trip rider, the motorman pulls another car into place. The doors are operated by compressed air and controlled by the trip rider from the platform above the tracks. Here he throws the lever which raises the door, letting the Langbanite ore roll down the chute into the mine car. All locomotives are equipped with telephones over which the motorman can keep in touch with all other trains on the underground railway system. And here is the main line on its run. This train has the right of way at all times on the main line track for it is the one which moves the ore to the bottom of number one shaft where all ore from both levels of the mine is hoisted to the surface. It hauls 24 cars on each run over rails as heavy as those on many surface railway lines. At number one station, the cars roll down the slight grade into the rotary dump. As the cager pushes a button, the mine car in all turns completely over, dumping the ore into a pit below. A whole train load of ore can be unloaded in this way in just a few minutes. And here comes the ore as another car is dumped. It moves along in little jerks on a pan conveyor until it drops over the edge into the primary crusher. See how it chews up those big boulders. It is crushed to a maximum size of four inches and goes on down into the loading pocket. Ore from the southwestern extension of the mine is dumped here into a pit 127 feet deep and which holds 1,200 tons of ore. This provides storage in case of delays in operations. From the bottom of the pocket, this conveyor carries the ore up a slope 810 feet long 
to a point 50 feet above number one dump where it is dropped into another smaller pocket. Out through the sloping chute at the bottom of the wall, the ore goes into the pit below number one dump and on into the hoist. The skip comes down the shaft and into the loading pocket where it is automatically filled before starting back. In less than a minute, nearly six tons of ore comes from its resting place in the ancient seabed back into the southwestern sunshine which it left 200 million years ago. Up into the top of the head frame it goes. The skip is tipped over and the ore is poured out into these ore bins. All of the ore is hoisted by this automatic hoist. 24 hours each day it raises one skip as the other is lowered, automatically pausing to load one skip while the other is dumped. Drawn out of the bottom of the ore bins, the ore travels on conveyors as it starts its trip to the refinery. In the crusher building, these screens pass the fine ore through to the refinery, while the coarse ore is carried by this conveyor on to the crushers, where it is crushed to the proper size. The crushed ore is weighed as it starts for the refinery, traveling on conveyors inside these housings to bins in the refinery building beyond. Mixed with brines, the ore is pumped up through these pipes to the first step in the processes which will remove the salt and leave the valuable potash. The ore is sized in this classifier. Fine ore passes out of one end while the coarser particles are dragged to the upper end where they are finally pushed over the edge and into this trough and on to the rod mills. These are drums six feet in diameter and 12 feet long. Inside these drums are steel rods two inches thick and 12 feet long. As the rod mill revolves, these rods roll and tumble, pulverizing the ore into particles so fine that they will float on a bubble. And that is just what is happening here in these first flotation cells. The potash rises to the top on the bubbles, is scraped off, then goes on to the cleaner cells where the separation of the potash from the salt is completed, leaving the salt to be drawn off from the bottom of the cells. This has produced 60% muriate of potash, which then goes to the centrifugal filters. Whirling parts inside the large drums throw the brines from the potash much the same as a spin dryer dries the family wash. The refined product comes out of these centrifugals onto this conveyor only slightly damp like sand on the beach. Potash in larger particles is produced in this granular flotation section to be put on top of soils as fertilizer. Notice the size of the crystals which have been floated to the surface riding on bubbles. Refining the langmanite ore is somewhat simpler. In this classifier the salt is dissolved in water permitting the coarse langbanite crystals to be dragged to the upper end where they are pushed off to pass through a centrifugal filter. All three of these products are finally dried in these rotary dryers which are five feet in diameter and 40 feet long. A fiery blast blows through their length, drying the potash as it passes along. Here is a close-up of the blaze showing the refined potash falling through the flame. Brines from the process go into tanks where they are cleared of slimes and impurities. Common salt contained in the ore is taken out of the brines by this horizontal filter. The brines are returned to be used again in the refining processes. Impurities are dumped into this sluice which carries them down into a disposal pond. Waste liquors are spread over a wide area so that the New Mexico sun and the dry atmosphere can evaporate the water, leaving the waste material spread out over the flat. Just beyond the dryers, 
are these bins where the finished products are stored. Two contain 60% muriate, another the granular, and the fourth sulpo mag, the exclusive international product from langbenite ore. The finished products are weighed as they start to market over this conveyor. The ore was weighed as it entered, and from these records the efficiency of the plant is maintained. The refined potash travels on a conveyor inside this housing to the top of the mammoth warehouse beyond. In this wing, two more products are refined. This section further refines a portion of the muriate, producing pure potassium chloride for the chemical trade. These tanks contain the muriate brines from the refinery. Solids are extracted in a filter and they are then passed over a scale before going into this tank to be mixed with water. Passing through an evaporator, the brine is then cleared of all impurities in this enclosed tank. In this crystallizer, pure potassium chloride crystals form as the temperature is lowered. They pass through a filter and into the dryer where the last vestige of moisture is removed to complete the process. All of this complicated and exact process is controlled from these panels. These dials and charts tell the operator just what is happening at each step. The foreman gives us a peek at the finished product, which is more than 99 and 9 tenths percent pure. The purity of this product must be protected at all times. It is carried high above the ground in an enclosed conveyor to the special warehouse in the distance. Here it is stored, ready for loading into cars for shipment to chemical plants. The other product of this section is sulfate of potash. Sulpomag, a double sulfate of potash and magnesia, is brought in, passed through a pulverizer and up through dust collectors to a conveyor which takes it to this bin. As it is drawn out of the bin, it is weighed before joining the two other feeds which go into this section. Saturated potassium chloride brines come in from the chemical section. Other liquors go to these evaporators to remove part of the water and heat them to the temperature needed for the next step. Cooled in this big tank, the solids crystallize. They are a mixture of potassium chloride, sulfate of potash, and sulfate of magnesia. They are pumped out of a tank by this pump and pass over this filter where the brine is drawn off and the solids dumped onto a conveyor. They are weighed and carried into the tank to join the two other feeds. In a series of tanks, a chemical reaction takes place, producing magnesium chloride and potassium sulfate. The potassium sulfate then goes through these centrifugal filters and on to this conveyor which dumps it into the dryer below. Here it is dried, taken on to its bin, and then over the big conveyor to the storage warehouse. This is 100 feet wide and 600 feet long. In the control room, the operator presses a button. The motors whirl and the cables draw the scoop out and up onto the pile of potassium sulfate. Then back it comes, bringing with it a load of the product, which is scraped into the hopper. From the hopper, it is taken to the top of this loading station where it is fed down to the car loader through pipes. High-speed pulleys and conveyors throw the potash back to the far end of the car. While most shipments are in bulk, some are bagged. This machine weighs each bag, filling it with just the right amount before it is dumped from the bagging machine onto a conveyor that carries it outside the building and into the waiting boxcar. 
A long train load of potash leaves the plant every day of the year. It will come back to us in cotton clothing, finer tobaccos, or better potatoes. It will make matches, fine crystal wear, television tubes, and brighter coloring in our clothing. It will bleach the paper for our magazines, make fine white leathers, and go into photographs and permanent waving solutions. The purity of these shipments is guarded by sampling and controls. Here, a sample is taken of the ore before it ever leaves the face in the mine. In the refinery and chemical plant, at every step in the process, samples are taken at regular intervals. Analysis of these samples guides the operators so that they may continue to produce the high quality products which our customers demand. Dried and ground, these samples are delivered to the laboratory where skilled chemists carefully weigh a portion and give it a number to identify it with the numbered sample. Through highly accurate chemical processes, all of the potash in the sample is brought out, leaving everything else to be discarded. Measurements and weights then determine the exact grade of the sample. But where will the miners work next to get the best ore? To answer this question, holes are drilled from the surface, bringing up samples of what lies 800, 850, and 900 feet below the surface to point the way for further mine expansion. Water for the processes comes from these two wells. Here the operator checks the temperature of this pump which runs day after day, forcing water through a 14-inch pipeline that stretches straight as an arrow 17 miles across the desert from the wells to the plant to become the lifeblood of the processes. A system of pipes spreads from the water tower like the human circulation system and reaches into every part of the plant. Supplies needed for operations arrive and are stored in this warehouse. Many pieces of equipment are made right on the job in shops which also keep the machinery in repair. A machine shop, a welding shop, and a steel shop. Pipe shops a blacksmith shop, carpenter and painting shops, and complete electric shops are maintained. Maintenance goes on in the refinery, the field, or wherever equipment is running. Mine mechanics keep the heavy equipment running without the delay of bringing it to the surface. On both levels, well-equipped shops are prepared to service the machines, make repairs, and install new parts when they are needed. About 900 undercutter bits and 350 drill bits must be sharpened each 24 hours. Here is a drill bit, properly sharpened for another shift's work. Well-equipped electric shops are maintained on each level of the mine, where motors may be repaired, cables spliced, the insulation vulcanized back into place, and all electrical equipment promptly serviced. The men coming up the drift first appear as lights bobbing in the darkness as the shift's work is finished. Miners, electricians, mechanics, and supervisors laugh and visit as they head for the station at the bottom of the shaft, where they again board the cage, which will take them up through the shaft to the surface. The supervisor signals the hoistman above, and the trip starts up. After changing clothes, they cross the yard and leave the plant. Some will ride the regularly scheduled buses. Others have carpools arranged so that each one drives one day each week. Most of them live in Carlsbad, a prosperous city of 25,000, 26 miles by paved road from the plant. High wages and steady employment in the potash industry have made it a city of fine homes. There are no factory sections and no silk stocking sections in Carlsbad. Most internationalites own their homes. Many have built them with their own hands, using the savings from their wages and doing the work in spare time. They not only live in Carlsbad, but are a part of the community in every way. In any community function, you are sure to see internationalites in active roles. 
and the company too is a part of the community. Here comes the international float, depicting the history of New Mexico from Coronado to the Atomic Age. Internationalites have been elected to the Carlsbad City Council. Others have held county offices and served on various committees. Most of them are active in the churches of their choice, and many of them have taken a major part in planning and building the many fine new churches which have grown up in Carlsbad in the past 12 years. With nearly a thousand sons and daughters entering the schools each fall, internationalites are interested in the schools. Carlsbad's school system maintains 231 rooms housed in 14 modern buildings. The company, too, has a very real interest in the schools, for taxes paid by it cover the cost of almost 30 of these classrooms. A typical scene shows an internationalite in the color guard, while another, as president of the Board of Education, accepts a new school building. Still another, exalted ruler of the Elks, presents the school with a flag. All this is one of the finest examples of why America is great. Thousands of Americans from all over the nation and all walks of life pooled their savings by buying shares in a company. This made it possible to build a great plant, to sink shafts nearly a thousand feet below the desert and uncover a treasure which was buried there more than 200 million years ago. Other Americans, free to seek employment wherever they wish, came and filled the jobs which this created. Working together, the stockholders, the company, and the men on the job brought this buried treasure up from the bed of a desert sea so that it could rebuild our soils, help America feed and clothe the free world, and increase the wealth of the state and the nation. For this treasure was worthless until it was brought up from its ancient resting place. All of this helped to build highways and schools and courthouses and churches. It helped a community to grow and made modern homes for families. And in this kind of working together lies the strength of America.